Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Alana Weiss, and today it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ernie Gunling to the Leading at Google series. Dr. Gunling is the co-founder of Aperion Global, a company that assists clients to develop strategic practices with a global mindset. Today, Dr. Gunling will discuss his new book, which officially comes out tomorrow, entitled, What is Global Leadership? His perspective is based not only on extensive research, but also his experience living throughout the globe. And because Google is a global company, which serves a global audience, we are very excited to hear from him today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gunling. So let's get started here. Welcome. And um, welcome to this particular topic, what is global leadership? So we're going to look at this topic about whether there's anything different or distinctive or unique about leading in a global context. And as we um, move forward here, um, there are several things that I'll do together with you. One is I'll give you some background to the research that we conducted. And then we'll go in, I'll try to give you some samples of the different stages of global leadership development, as well as some of the behaviors of very successful global leaders. And then also, because I understand a number of you work with global teams, I'll try to give you some examples of, of practical applications of all this to a global team context. Sound all right? Why is this a topic that's important now and will be increasingly important <clears throat> as we go forward? So, we all know that we're in the middle of a, <clears throat> a population explosion, the biggest that the planet has ever seen. And we all know that the globe's population is going to go through a process of roughly tripling over the span of just 100 years. But what's a little bit less well known is that virtually 100% of this growth is occurring in the developing world. So in 1950, um, not so long ago, 60 years ago, the population of the developed world and the population of the developing world was roughly equal, about 1.5 billion to 1 billion, and total global population of 2.5 billion. The latest estimate actually for the total um, ultimate population peak on the planet is uh, now over 10 billion, so it's actually increased since this, uh, this particular data came out. So, from 1.5 billion to 10 billion, virtually 100% of that growth is occurring in the developing world. So what does that mean for you? If we consider the, the demographic of your audience, the kinds of people that you're trying to, to reach and to interest in the kinds of services that you provide, 90% of the world's children under the age of 15 currently already live in the developing world. So, think about the implications of that for your markets, for the languages that you offer your services in, for the kinds of counterparts that you're going to have on the teams that you're in, as well as the future of the, the planet and of uh, Google. And we're literally going to be in an environment where you're competing with everyone from everywhere for everything. And when we work with clients, we see typically a, a progression where a client or a company that's primarily domestic in nature, if they've got 90% of their sales in their home market, they don't care so much about what it means to work in a global context. Then typically, they opportunistically will look for opportunities to sell their, their products, their services overseas. So when they get to a point where they're maybe 25% of their revenues abroad, they'll look for opportunities to duplicate their op operations in various locations around the world. And that's typically a kind of octopus model of a company where you have a big headquarters uh, at home and then you've got operations around the world who follow orders from headquarters and who uh, participate in the global enterprise but as secondary players. But as you move into uh, an environment such as the one you're in, the latest figure I saw, 53% of your sales now come from outside of this country, then global really matters. And so you begin to look at structures, you begin to look at systems, you begin to look at uh, ways of developing people that take global very seriously. And that's definitely the world that you're part of right now. So there are many ways in which uh, people respond to or encounter this topic of globalization. 
One is, I just hope it will go away. <laughs> um, you know, it, it creates more complication. We use the term multiplexity, so you've got uh, multiple kinds of problems to worry about that are very, very complex. And isn't it something that maybe is just a fad and it will go away? Well, based on that, uh, the numbers or the statistics that I just showed you, it's absolutely not going to go away. And it's going to get more and more, uh, be more and more of a compelling part of the environment that you're in. We also have people who, who would wishfully ask, can't you train them, that is, those other people, <laughs> whoever they're from, to work effectively with me? Well, that might be part of the solution, but it, it doesn't uh, exempt us from the need to make some modifications in our own behavior. And then we also have uh, the, the wishful thinking or the myth that business practices around the world are converging to some kind of global standard. Yes, there may be some ways in which they are converging, but there are other ways in which um, they're perhaps diverging or not becoming more similar at all. So this is a, a comforting way to um, uh, may maybe think about the problem, but it's definitely not um, a very constructive. And another a final approach is, okay, so I'm gonna have to deal with country X next week. If I could just learn a few do's and don'ts, I'll be fine. Again, that approach um, has serious limitations, particularly after the first 15 or 20 minutes that you're actually dealing with real people from that country or in that meeting together with them. So when companies then move on to think more uh, strategically about how we can develop ourselves in a global context, they begin to ask themselves a couple of things, particularly pertaining to leadership. They recognize that in order to grow in some of their key markets around the world, they have to have really effective leaders that are in and from those markets. And also those leaders need to be able to collaborate effectively with each other on a global basis. And think about things like how many global meetings, video conferences, other uh, teleconferences, other forms of meetings occur uh, within your company on a daily basis. And then how many people participate in those meetings? What's their investment of time? What's the cost per employee? And then you can begin to calculate and perhaps even estimate conservatively, do you think that a good global team leader could make that team 5% more effective, 10% more effective, 15% more effective? And if they could, then what would be the value to your enterprise as a whole. So it's not too hard to get into the tens of millions of dollars, if not um, higher sums, quite quickly when you begin to calculate uh, in this sort of way. We um, had a chance to uh, talk to many, many clients, and they often said, We've, we're doing things in the leadership area, but we're not sure how well this applies to other locations around the world. Here are some leading uh, approaches to this subject, and I'd ask you, what do they have in common? If these are the dominant leadership paradigms of our age, do they apply in this global context, and, and to what extent are they culturally embedded? So if you begin to try to boil down uh, generic approaches to leadership, and you look at the work of Cotter and others, very, very fine um, and, and strongly research-based uh, approaches, you'll see that often it begins with establishing a vision. So you need to have a vision for your team, for your unit, for your project, for your organization, and then you look for ways to communicate that, to align the organization, to coach other people uh, in order to implement that vision, to look for ways to motivate your team, and ultimately to uh, raise and develop other leaders within your team context. Does this sound familiar? So. Some of you have at least, uh, I'm sure, have been exposed to this kind of theory. And then from a management context, there are also the, the more day-to-day -day or mundane tasks of planning and budgeting and thinking about how to best allocate resources, how to manage those resources, how to look at performance and judge performance, and ultimately to um, take that whole planning cycle and move from uh, a plan to a deliverable. So I think a, it's useful to actually consider what's... Um, generic management in that sense as well. And there's a tendency for us to want to skip right to leadership and say, oh, well, management is, is boring. Um, I'd rather be a leader if I had a choice than a manager. But actually, I think that if you look at what real leaders do, they have to both exercise leadership and management. 
And if you look at what people in, in managerial roles need to do, they also need to exercise both leadership and management. So I'd encourage you, as you take a generic approach to this topic, to think about what can I do to improve both my leadership capabilities and my management capabilities, and how can I balance those as I move forward? And whether you're a top executive in a company or you're just heading up a global project, you're going to need some balance of both of these things. So generic leadership, generic management. And the limitation of these approaches when we begin to look at the global context and when we begin to think about uh, the the approaches to leadership that have global applied to them are many, and here are just a few of them. One is that uh, there's not a clear distinction often between what we call leadership in a generic sense and leadership in a global sense. Also, you have very general characteristics such as global savvy or inquisitiveness that are hard to implement on a daily basis. Or another uh, tendency is that so-called global behaviors uh, are, again, in a, in a sense of wishful thinking, uh, corporate values or ideas that consultants might have that are applied uh, broadly. And we went to Singapore, we gave it a try, seemed to work, so we're going to call it global. And I'd, I'd uh, suggest that most of these approaches are inadequate. So what we did in the course of our research <clears throat> was we attempted to look at some people who had experience both leading in a global context and leading in a domestic context. The way we did that was we approached 14 different organizations. We asked them to give us their most successful expatriates. Now, we did this not because we wanted to focus on expatriates in particular, but because we wanted to have people who could compare their leadership experience in a global context with their leadership experience in a domestic context. These people, as you can see here on the screen, came from a wide variety of different countries, some 20-some different countries and also uh, were based in a wide variety of countries as well. And you can see that more than three quarters of these <clears throat> had had multiple assignments. So we're talking about people who are very experienced global leaders and typically were heading up a whole country operation, were heading up a functional role uh, or a region uh, within their organization. So wonderful people to talk to and it was really a, a pleasure and a privilege to interact with them. In fact, over the last uh, the course of the last several years, uh, it's been um, uh, one of the most fulfilling parts of my work to have a chance to interview these folks, to read what they have to say, and to think about then <clears throat> what is it that they're telling us which may be different or unique. So <clears throat> among the set of questions that we asked them were two in particular. What's the difference based on your experience between leading in a global context and leading in a domestic context? And also, how would you apply this, not just to people who are living outside of their home country, but to people in any role within an organization? And so we look very carefully at their responses uh, to these questions. And of course, there's some overlap between global leadership and what you might call generic leadership and intercultural skills. <clears throat> But we feel that um, based on these interviews, they came up with a pretty distinctive uh, set of capabilities around global leadership. So what's different, of course, there's geography and time zones and language and different kinds of its institutions, et cetera. Uh, and some of these drive the differences that we're talking about. So here's the model that we distilled from the interview contents. And you can see it's got five different stages as well as 10 behaviors that um, uh, were uh, distilled out of these interviews. Let's go into these uh, step by step. And for those of you who like acronyms, we have uh, an acronym called SCOPE, which um, stands for the first letter of each of these models. So seeing differences is the S, then looking for ways to close the gap, the C, opening the system, the O, preserving balance, the P, and establishing solutions, the E. So the first set of behaviors, initially, what's absolutely vital is that in a global leadership context, you have to be able to look for and see the differences. Of course, there are similarities. Of course, there are ways in which um, cultures overlap or are alike. But there are also real differences that make a difference within your uh, work context. And so being able to see these and do something with them is crucial. Now, 
That begins with what our interviewees referred to in various ways as a, an ability to stand outside of yourself, to say, my style, my way of leading was shaped by a particular set of cultural circumstances, a particular way of upbringing, a family, a, a school system, uh, perhaps a stint in the military, my organizational background. And that's one way of doing things, but actually there are a lot of other ways of potentially getting things done in this context. And I can choose the way that I brought with me, or perhaps there would be another way that would be equally effective. So having that sense of distance uh, towards your own way of doing things, this kind of cultural self-awareness was a first step. And without this, you go nowhere. And then the next step, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, this um, next one, I'll try to give you an example of at least one of the behaviors from each of these five stages, has to do with what we called invite the unexpected. So what these leaders told us is that almost every day, I would run across something that I just flat out didn't expect. Uh, and that might be a different competitor, a different customer, a logistical issue, um, some kind of software problem, um, a, a, perhaps a programming methodology that I hadn't been familiar with. So they would constantly come into contact with these uh, kinds of unexpected events. And they found that in order to be successful, they had to not only uh, open their minds to see them, but also make a practice of looking for these kinds of things on a daily basis. And that the most successful leaders in this global context were the ones who could not only bring what they had to the party, but also recognize the existing strengths of the organization of the people that they were working with and integrate those into their operations as well. So I think many of you may be familiar with this experiment um, by a, a professor by the name of Daniel Simons at the University of Illinois. Are you familiar with this, where the pa passing back and forth of basketball on the stage, you're supposed to count the number of passes, a uh, gorilla walks by, beats its chest in the middle of the stage, and then walks off the stage. So what percent of people miss the gorilla? Does anybody know? It's over 50%, yeah, yeah. So it's an outrageously high number of people don't see this gorilla saunter across the stage, and they don't see the gorilla uh, beat its chest and move uh, to <clears throat> the, from stage right to stage left. So there's something that we call, in the research on this, it's inattentional blindness. So it's something that if we don't expect it, our brain literally doesn't allow us to see it. If we don't expect it, we just literally don't see it. And I would suggest that for those of you who are working in a global context, <clears throat> this is a real conundrum because there are all kinds of things that we wouldn't know to expect because we've never seen it before. And there are gorillas everywhere <laughs> within the global environment, within the global team environment. And so as you, as you look and think and, and consider about <clears throat> the work that you do in your own global teams, you might uh, look for, uh, make a deliberate um, a discipline for yourself of looking for what might be unexpected. So I just want to give you a few examples from my recent experience. How many of you know about Mick Delivery? Okay, well, it's happening in China. You can get McDonald's delivered to your home uh, in China 24 hours a day, and they're expanding it to other parts of the country. It started in 2009 during the financial crisis, and uh, they were looking for a way to sell more McDonald's products there, and they've found a way to do that. So that would be one example of something that we just, who would expect getting it delivered to your home here in Mountain View? Um, some of you may know that instant messaging is preferred in China over email by many people. Uh, so Tencent and their QQ uh, instant messaging service is very, very popular, competes effectively with some of the other alternatives, including yours. Um, and they also have avatars that allow you to clothe yourself as a sleek and attractive person 10 years younger than you are every time you send someone an instant message. Um, so that would be another example. There's a Latin American country where uh, a very major U.S. retailer is really struggling with the competition because their uh, definition of creditworthiness has to do with bank accounts and what people can demonstrate in terms of income and assets, but the competition is actually sending out a, a whole fleet of credit folks on motorcycles to look at the establishment or the home where this individual lives, judge their assets through looking around and, and 
walking through the home, and then qualifying a purchase for consumer goods like a refrigerator or a washing machine, this enables them to reach a far larger audience. Um, one other example, I think many of you, of course, would know Wipro and its IT uh, division, which is an important player here in Silicon Valley. But how many of you know that they're also a competitor to Procter & Gamble and that they sell vegetable oil and soap and that their original name was actually Western Indian Vegetable Products? So all examples of the unexpected. I also like uh, the Petrobras example because Petrobras is this uh, Brazilian oil monopoly which our, our image of a, a monopoly is that it's probably inefficient and corrupt and ecologically dangerous, but actually this one, uh, Petrobras, is, is on target to become one of the largest, if not the largest, oil company in the world. Um, rather progressive in terms of their approach to alternative energy, have gone from being an ecological disaster to being an ecological model, and have some very advanced technologies in terms of deep sea drilling and so forth that's become re very relevant in the last couple of years. So all examples of things that we might not expect and yet uh, which are out there. And I'd submit that within your own world, there are dozens of things that can be noticed on a daily basis. <clears throat> so if you're working on a global team, what, what's just something practical that you can do about this? Um, one thing is to <clears throat> read the paper for the countries that your team members are from. And so this would be an example in the uh, Globe Smart tool, which uh, Google has. You're, you have links to all of these local papers in countries around the world. You can also find these links yourselves. So if you want to find out what's on the minds of your colleagues in India, read the paper. Um, get a sense of what's, what the current topics are, not just in terms of the business world, which this happens to be um, yesterday's uh, paper, but also uh, you can look at the world of cricket or the, the world of social entertainment, et cetera. Also, there might be some questions that you more systematically think about asking your team members. So these might be things like, do they have the same tools available outside of the business day if they're commuting from home? In many countries, they don't. Or what's their, their business day, their work week, their holiday calendar? Um, do the team members in other locations have the same priorities as you do or as team members in your country do? Or, what are the team members' expectations of, of you as a leader as you get into these leadership roles? So um, these are all things that you can begin to look at more systematically to invite the unexpected and to begin to consider <clears throat> how I can integrate that into my work. And then in terms of personally cultivating your own career and, and thinking about steps for you going forward, there are a variety of different experiences that you can chart for yourself or together with the people that you work with that may involve um, both very uh, simple steps uh, and also some more complicated steps. They might mean hosting visitors from abroad. Not very difficult, um, not, not necessarily very different, but a good starting place. It might involve a short-term project that would take you elsewhere. It might involve uh, ultimately moving into a global assignment in a different location. It might involve working in a variety of different global team contexts. So you can begin to think about and plan your own career and consider what's the degree of difficulty and the degree of difference um, that I'm ready for at this particular time. And ultimately, what will help you with this um, inviting the unknown is what we call this fish out of water experience. So, so fishes are most comfortable in water. And if, they, if they're out of the water, um, they, are, they are able to see things in a different way, have a whole different perspective on the ocean. And you should consider for yourselves, too, what's the water that I'm in, and how can I make myself a fish out of that water? Um, one other point that, that our interviewees stressed, <clears throat> and um, many of you, I think, are, are still in the very good zone for language learning, is don't forget language. Now, we tend to dismiss it because we're dealing with so many countries, or it's such an effort to learn a language. But even a, a moderate effort to learn a language actually changes the way that your brain is set up because you're, you're learning the culture that's embedded in the language and you're learning a different way of looking at things. So many of the people that we spoke with stress the importance of actually learning another language and being able to acquire fluency in a way that helps you to understand the people that you're working with on a daily basis. Okay, so we've talked about seeing differences, and we've looked at particular at the skill of inviting the unexpected. 
And now we'll move on to closing the gap. So once you've seen the differences, then you be, need to begin to think about how to address them in the context of a team so we can work effectively together. And there are two different behaviors, as in each of the areas in this one. And the first has to do with results through relationships. So in virtually every other country around the world outside of the US, relationships are more critical um, in the initial phases of a team effort than they would be here. And there are a whole variety of ways or practices uh, by which you can go about establishing those. But the folks that we interviewed said that in the course of their global leadership development, they became less confident that they could get things done themselves. So the mark of a failed team leader, of a failed expatriate, is that they're working late at night trying to do things because the darn team members can't get them done. Uh, but more confident that they were able to, would be able to get these things done through other people. So that's a very critical um, uh, piece that was emphasized over and over again is this getting results through relationships. And the second area is what we called frame shifting, which occurs on multiple levels, both in terms of communication style, in terms of leadership style, and also in terms of strategy. So we'll look into that a little bit. So here's a, an example of a team. Uh, and let's say that Steffi Hagel, who's in the red, is the uh, team leader. And you can see that uh, in this profile, which comes from the GlobeSmart tool that you've all got access to, there are these dimensions of independent versus interdependent, egalitarianism and status, risk and restraint, direct and indirect, task and relationship, and short-term and long-term orientation. So, for this Steffi Hegel, if she's got the profile that you see in red, uh, what might be some advice that we would give her? Yep, so if she is very, very direct, then she's got a whole team of people who are more indirect than she is. So, for instance, if you get into solving a problem, or if you're working with a, uh, a kind of confrontational situation, she will need to be more indirect, as you suggest, uh, because um, many members of her team might have a totally different approach or style for solving problems. And even to find out what the problem is, she may have to take a more indirect approach. Any other advice you'd have for Steffi as a team leader? Yeah, so um, comment was more relationship oriented. And if she's extremely task oriented and she's got a number of people on the team, half the team or more is, is relationship oriented, then she's gonna need to look for ways in the first days or month of that team effort to figure out how can I actually get to know the other team members as people because they might be shocked and offended and, and uh, appalled if, if she were to launch into the task right away, which um, is often the tendency. So beginning with communication style and leadership style, there are some ways in which we need to be able to contemplate how to shift effectively <clears throat> in order to work in this team context. And likewise with communication style, if we're used to a, a low context form of communication, which relates to a very direct communication style, and we're in a, in a position of conflict, would you send an email? Mm -hmm. Yep, yes. Uh -huh. So the question is how to create such a profile for team members. You actually have a, a method within Google to do that. You can generate exactly this profile for your team and compare the actual people on your team. And it's, it's within the GlobeSmart web tool, um, and this is an example of a profile from it. So every one of you who are at the company can generate this profile both for yourself, uh, you can compare yourself to different countries, and you can also compare the members of your team. So it's a it's a, a nice and kind of fun way to take the, the similarities and differences, begin to look at them objectively, and consider what can we do to work together most effectively as a team. Yes, it's available in Google. Thank you. <laughs> so. You might also consider this whole range of communication behaviors, and um, I understand that you use video conferencing pretty frequently. That's great because it's a higher context form of communication, so 
as you get into starting up a team or solving difficult, delicate problems, then you may want to consider one of these higher context forms of communication. I love this uh, brain research, the, the neurological research in relation to culture that's coming out. So let me offer another example to you. There's actually a, a brain-based difference between people in the US and people in East Asia, according to this particular experiment, or series of experiments, rather. So people from the US tend to notice and focus on objects that are in the foreground, whereas the experimental subjects from East Asia tend to notice and focus on the relationship between different objects and the context. So we actually see different things when we look at the same picture. Also, um, people from the US tend to notice changes in foreground objects uh, that might be missed by people from East Asia, but on the other hand, people from East Asia will notice changes in context or background that are missed by people from the US. Isn't that fascinating? And then, uh, to, to top it all off, we're actually, even when we're looking at the same scene, when they do the, <clears throat> the MRI scan, we're using different sections of the brain, the same human brain, to view the same scene. So, so we're actually literally viewing the, the, the same team meeting through different parts of our, uh, of our respective brains, which, which means that it's very, very deeply embedded. And so as a team leader, as a team member, it, it's worth considering high context versus low context because it's a neurologically based difference uh, between cultures. So as we get into <clears throat> more thinking about how I, I might run, if I'm in a leadership role, how might I run a particular team, there's an interesting study by Andre Laurent. And he asked the question, is it important for a manager to have precise answers about questions that my subordinates might raise at work? And you can see that <clears throat> at the far end of the spectrum are some of the Scandinavian, Northern European countries, as well as the US, where the expectation is no. The, the, the team lead, the manager, needs to be more of a facilitator. And it's not their job to have all the answers. But on the other hand, you may well have people within the context of your same team, your same organization, who are at the other end of the spectrum. And their expectation is, yes, it's actually quite important for the manager to have precise answers um, to my questions. And so as a team lead, then you need to begin to think about, Am I going to um, go with one set of behavior? Am I going to try to modify my behavior? Am I going to do what I'm used to? Am I going to train others to work effectively with me? There are many different effective strategies for um, approaching this kind of, of um, difference or dilemma. But the, the bottom line is you need to be able to think it, through, think it through consciously and to approach it in a very deliberate way. So just to give you an example of another of the, these wonderful people that we interviewed, this is a person we'll call Hannah. So she's from a northern European country, uh, works for a very famous uh, European organization. Um, all of, uh, I'm virtually certain that 100% of you have used their products. Um, and she was assigned from her location in northern Europe to the Czech Republic. And it's the habit in the country where she comes from to share information and to have a very democratic decision-making style. And so she was sharing information and trying to make democratic decisions. And what she found was that the people in her meetings were bored and were going to sleep and were unhappy. And soon, actually, her warehouse manager quit and she had to go into a job where she was actually managing 80-some employees in the Czech Republic on the factory floor. She had to totally change her style. So she would get out a box, she would show people how to pack the box, she would say we need 400 of these by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, go do it, and everybody happily went off and did it. So she went from a, more of a consultative style of leadership, which would be common sense in this environment, to more of a directive style of leadership, um, and that proved in this particular environment to be far more effective, and her workers were far more happy. So <clears throat> frame shifting means to switch communication style, to change leadership style. And it may even involve, we talked about generic leadership before, it may even involve contradicting some of the established wisdom about generic leadership. So some of the things that we heard, I interviewed this fellow who um, was from uh, 
from the US but had worked for uh, several years in Russia and had headed up his company's subsidiary there. And the first thing he said my employees told me was, we don't care about your vision. <laughs> it sounds to us like propaganda. We've been fed this steady diet of propaganda for the last many decades. <clears throat> we don't want to hear any more propaganda. So what you need to do first is to establish personal loyalty. And once you get that done, then your employees will do anything. And in fact, <clears throat> after six months or nine months, we might even listen to your vision. Okay? So dispense with the vision. And that would be an example of frame shifting that actually contradicts this generic wisdom <clears throat> about what leadership involves. Or another one, Russia's got just it's so rich with many examples, but here's a guy who comes in and says, I'm a change agent. And uh, the employees say, well, sorry, but the system cannot be changed. But, but we can help you beat the system. And so then that gets you into a whole other world of how, how am I going to take this approach and do it in a way that's consistent with, with my values and the company's values and so forth. And on the most strategic level, there may be frame shifting involved as well in the sense that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the strategy that works for one uh, country, whether it's in terms of the positioning of the products, the features of the products, <clears throat> the supply chain, et cetera, et cetera, may be totally the wrong formula in another environment. So you need, may need to frame shift on that level as well. So reaching out, inviting the unexpected, and then in this frame shifting context, examining both what's my communication style, what's my leadership style, what's my strategy in this frame shifting sense so that I can be most effective in the global context that I'm working in. Okay, we're going to move on to this third area of opening the system and developing future leaders. So you've, you've seen the differences. You've seen the differences. You've begun to look for personal ways to close the gap through relationships, through this frame shifting, things that you yourself can do. But there may also be more systemic issues. There may be ways in which, <clears throat> and you can think about this within your own team, within your own organization, who are the people on the margins? Who are the people on the periphery? Who are the people who might have less information, who might have a less of a role in how decisions are actually made? And what could their contribution be to the organization? What might they contribute to the decision? What might they contribute to the implementation? And sometimes you need to be able to look for ways to really impact the system as a whole. So expanding ownership, the first of these behaviors, means to deliberately look for ways to consider the people who are going to be involved in the implementation, who are going to have Im information that could be critical to making the best decisions, and to involve them <clears throat> in the process. And this might, be, this might mean changing the, the, the way that a, a decision is made, the way that a, a process is carried out. It might mean giving them a little bit broader set of parameters that allow them to uh, have a little bit more running room in establishing uh, their approach to things. And then the other behavior here, which we'll talk some more about, uh, is developing future leaders. So in a generic leadership context, of course, it's part of your responsibility to develop future leaders. <clears throat> but in the global context, it's a little more challenging. So who do we typically judge as being the really high potential future leader? It's somebody who looks like me. Okay. So really seems talented, bright, intelligent. I can tell because uh, they speak my language, they communicate effectively with me, their mind thinks like I do, and we work really comfortably together. This is a totally bad standard for making a decision about who should be a future leader, and yet it's a, a tendency that is quite pervasive. And this can have to do with, with language, with looking at behaviors and not at results. It can, it can also be based on um, a, a misinterpretation or a misjudgment of um, somebody else's conduct based on their values. And also, um, there may be developmental practices that are inappropriate for a particular environment. So I want to tell you a, a story. Uh, and this is a, a fellow who I will name. His name is Diowari Buare. Uh, comes from Mali, originally. Uh, works with CARE. So among the 14 organizations uh, whose folks we interviewed, this was one of the leaders that CARE shared with us. And uh, Diowari Buare was born in Mali in a very rural area. And he went to work for the care organization in that country, did a good job, 
was eventually sent next door to Benin uh, and worked in the management in that area. He was, well, it was a whole series of firsts with uh, Diawari. And one of the first, he was the first person from Mali, which is a landlocked West African country and um, uh, doesn't necessarily export a lot of talent. He was the first person from his country to work in a management role outside of Mali. And then after that, he was sent to uh, Burundi, which is, as you may know, is a, uh, more of a, a conflict zone in Central Africa, and <clears throat> had to change his management style in some ways there because there were actually physical threats based on some of the changes that he was trying to implement uh, based on tribal rivalries. And then after that, Kerr assigned him to Nepal. So another first, he was one of the very first uh, African nationals to work in a management role in Asia and probably the very first African that many of the people in his organization in Nepal had ever seen, ever run across. So he was the assistant country director there. And then finally now he's the care country director for Sierra Leone. So back in West Africa in a very responsible role with a couple of hundred people reporting to him in his organization. So this is someone who's, who's come from a uh, walking to school barefoot to a very, very critical role, and just a few of the, the wonderful things that he had to say. First of all, in terms of frame shifting, he found that as he went from country to country and role to role, he had to change his approach. So for instance, as he went to Nepal, he found that he needed to take much more of a, a coaching or a mentoring approach because if he'd pushed like he was able to do in countries where he had uh, more common background or credibility, uh, he wouldn't have had the same results. He also, in turn, part of his work in Nepal was looking at um, uh, particular constituencies within the community, whether it's the delete or the un untouchable class or women who weren't actually even getting the, the, the privileges that they were supposed to get within their own system and with their own government. Um, he worked with them to help them um, stand up for themselves and to um, to actually get the funding that was supposed to be allocated to them, or in the case of the, the women, they were paid at half the rates of men, so they were able to get a number of the women's organizations to, to gain equal pay, which amounted to a 100% increase in their compensation. So a tremendous achievement in terms of being able to, to widen this circle uh, of power and leadership. And then finally, within his own organization, he's, he's talked about constantly looking for ways to give a voice to people who don't have it. So, Within your teams, you might think about who are the quiet ones? Who are the ones maybe at the other end of a video conference or a conference call who maybe don't have so much to say, who are more indirect in terms of their communication style, who haven't participated so much? And maybe it's an issue of capability, but maybe it's an issue of the fact that they haven't been included. And, and am I able and willing as a, as a leader in my own organization and you don't have to be a, a team leader or a project leader to do this, to identify and to champion somebody on the other side of the world who's very different from me, but who nonetheless can make a big contribution to the organization and what we do. And there are a variety of ways um, systemically in which you can achieve a, a global or local balance. <clears throat> and some of these are more, um, perhaps you need more of a standard solution as in an IT system. Product development may be in between, and sales and marketing, you may need more local adjustment or local um, accommodation. So this balance uh, in the way that you alter the system may vary from location to location. Um, a few things that you might consider doing in a global team context, and I'll just mention a couple of them. One of the things that we found is, is very effective in some organizations in terms of developing future leaders is to establish a tag team. So you might have somebody who's based at headquarters, somebody based in a different location. The two of them together have this tremendous capability to both integrate local circumstances and no local knowledge, as well as to um, make, think, make sure that things move through the decision-making process in a headquarters context. Uh, you might also think about <clears throat> mutual progress reports, so it's not just me checking on their progress, but it's also me reporting on progress and an opportunity to check both ways. So once you've had a chance to both see the differences and you've made that opportunity, you've, you've looked for ways on a personal basis that you can close the gap 
uh, you thought about ways that you can open the system, both in terms of, of decision making and in terms of um, enabling future kinds of leaders who might be very different from you to develop. There are also ways in which it's important to preserve balance. So what our interviewees told us was that I had to not only adapt, of course you have to adapt, of course you had to be flexible, but I also had to look for ways in which I could add value. Um, because for me, in this leadership role, I wasn't there just to be flexible, wasn't there just to adapt, but I also, in a leadership role, I had to find ways to contribute to the team. I had to not only learn, but also teach. But the trick was getting the balance right. The trick was getting the timing right. And if I was used to having some combination of adaptation and adding value in my home environment, uh, it was really tricky to find that appropriate balance in a new context. And likewise, core values and flexibility, what many of our interviewees told us is that in, in a variety of environments around the world, whether you're working from headquarters or whether you're actually resident in that environment, it was absolutely critical to know what your core values are. And the reason for that is because you can get lost in a, in a world where there may be different forms of corruption, there may be uh, ethical issues that go beyond corruption, there may be uh, moral issues, there may be a whole variety of, of challenges that you could run into, and the people who didn't know uh, what their core values were, uh, were not effective. And likewise, the people who came with too many core values were inflexible and ineffective. So one exercise that I'd suggest for you on the teams that you're part of is to really think about what are the critical few core values that I want to maintain no matter what. And it should be a really short list, like three or four. And, and also, as you begin to um, establish those and share those with your team members, you may want to think about, do we have the same definition of those? We've actually struggled with clients who have said, we're going to roll out a core value of integrity for our, our company around the world. But they go into countries where it's just untranslatable. And one definition of integrity may be totally different from another definition of integrity. Or if we're looking at respect as a core value, the way that respect is demonstrated in one context may be totally different from the way that respect is demonstrated in another context. So have a discussion both with yourself and with others in your team around what are the core values that, that I want to be able to preserve as a team leader. And then finally, as we get into establishing solutions, because that's what any leader needs to do ultimately, it's worth considering <clears throat> how can I influence across boundaries and what do we do together to create solutions? And I'll just say a couple of things about um, this area. But influencing across boundaries involved from, from the standpoint of the, the people that we talk to, they call themselves ambassadors, um, ambassadors in a variety of different ways. They were seen as, as an ambassador for the company to employees from other locations who perhaps uh, had never been to the headquarters. They also found that they were engaged in a kind of shuttle diplomacy. So one guy told us that he had one set of slides for India when he went to India because he had to explain the U.S. to India. And then he had another slide for the U.S. because he had to explain India back to the U.S. And then he had to work back and forth in this kind of shuttle diplomacy context to create real understanding. Um, this is a little bit more about that example. And then in a, in a globally matrixed organization, knowing who the stakeholders of your various team members are is equally crucial. Because you may have stakeholders uh, that are very, very important to your other team members that your other team members haven't shared because they're so obvious to them and yet can really affect um, the performance and the direction of your team. So who are all those stakeholders out there of your extended network and how might you incorporate them? And then in addition, we find that in many teams, a challenge is um, around influencing across boundaries. We have separate reporting relationships, conflicting metrics, we have uh, challenges around different organizational structures and strategies in our respective environments, different customer demands, and that creates a lot of personal tension within the team. So you can look at those systemic issues and in terms of working across the matrix, make sure that um, those are not uh, a key part of the challenge. So one of the, I'll just select one area that, that we would recommend for your global team is to consider 
getting all of the matrix stakeholders involved and on board and doing an orchestrated rollout in a way that incorporates the input and incorporates the blessing and endorsement of those stakeholders because that'll prevent you down the road from having a lot of problems, a lot of individual issues between team members who are serving different masters. So I'll leave you with this, which is that um, a lot of us in a global team context think that we need to be an advocate. Uh, that is, we go in advocating a particular point of view, uh, and we think we need to defend a particular position or a particular interest. But as you grow into a leadership role, I think part of the secret and part of the way that you come up with, with optimally effective solutions is to consider, how can I be a catalyst? How can I, instead of advocating a particular point of view, ensure that we bracket the ideas that we come in with, that we draw out ideas, thoughts from each other, that we create options together, and then we select the best option for the organization as a whole. In that catalyst role, I think you'll find that you're far more effective as a leader than if you're serving as an advocate for a particular point of view. So um, I'll close with that, but um, uh, we have these five stages and 10 behaviors. I'd encourage you to take a look at the book, and um, thank you very much. Be happy to respond to any questions. Um, what you, how do you overcome a negative perception? Uh, if you're working in a different culture, um, how do you overcome a negative perception that maybe that nation may have towards you because you um, are a certain, come from a certain country of origin or you're a certain race? Does mm -hmm. uh, so that make sense? Absolutely. I can give an example of uh -huh. Croatian, so if uh -huh. I were to go into, um, to work in Serbia, there may be some people, because of the history and the war between the two nations, there may be some negative perceptions mm -hmm. towards me just because the you know, mere fact of the yeah. immigration. How would you sure. um, overcome that? Yeah. So some of these animosities are historical and very deep-seated, and it's hard to make them go away. but. What we found, it goes back to that point around results through relationships. We found that um, if you can establish a personal relationship with your counterparts, then they're willing to overlook where you came from. Um, I've spent a lot of time in, in Saudi Arabia, for example, and you would think that there might be some um, animosity in terms of Islam and Christianity and different backgrounds, different cultures, different environments, but what I found is that the more I get to know uh, individuals from a particular country, the more I see them as that and not necessarily as waving the country flag all the time. So a lot of people will say, ah, results through relationships, I'll skip that step, but that's why it's so important. Pretty soon you'll find that there are all kinds of Serbians and there are all kinds of Croatians and there are all kinds of Saudis and there are all kinds of people from the US. And, and what you'll often hear abroad, even as a, as a citizen of the US traveling is, well, there may be some things that the country does that I don't agree with, but um, I've really enjoyed the people that I've met. And, and it's that kind of personal diplomacy, or back to the ambassador point, that kind of personal ambassadorship that I think just makes a huge difference because ultimately it also changes their view of the country. Hope that helps. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Um, so one of the challenges that we face here at Google, I think, in terms of um, having this message around global leadership resonate, aside from the um, more kind of technical challenges, time zones, etc., is that um, a lot, most, for the vast majority of folks who work here, we work with internal teams. We don't work with external folks. And what we found through, you know, the aggregate reports. Um, even within the Globe Smart tool, is that there is, regardless of kind of country of origin, a fairly similar cultural profile of Googlers. So for them, it's kind of like, well, we're, we're kind of all the same in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm sure people in certain places feel that more than yeah, in other yeah. places as well. But in terms of kind of making the case or you know, asking them questions that, that do reveal for them those moments where, oh, actually, maybe there was something there that I wasn't paying attention to. Sure. That's hard, and so what advice would you give for us? Mm. 
Yeah, that's a wonderful, um, complex question. First of all, let me say that there are ways in which um, corporate culture is very important, and it may uh, override um, national culture. Uh, and at the same time, many people have a stake in saying, oh, yes, I'm just like you, or yes, we're, we're all the same, aren't we? And that may or may not be true. Uh, so it's, it's easy to have that as an ideology when you get into the, the kind of nitty-gritty behaviors, and the response I'd, I'd give more specifically is to look at, okay, so what do we do in the first five minutes of a meeting together? Uh, what would be your expectations? What would be your expectations in terms of a performance review? Um, how might we go about resolving a conflict? When you begin to look into those uh, specific activities, that's when the differences tend to emerge. And then I think it's also very useful to think about who's the end user? Who's the customer that we're trying to serve? What are the markets that we're trying to serve? And how can we make sure that even if we all feel a sense of kinship and camaraderie inside the organization, what can we do to best serve that uh, external user who may have very different tastes and preferences than uh, what we internally do? So making sure that you're, you're open to that outside world and the unexpected uh, events and tendencies that it can bring. Okay, so I think with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you very much. <laughs>